Well, I'm very pleased to finally uh, hook up with former RLI captain Hamish McIntyre, who's in a far-flung place. He's led an action-packed um, life. Uh, in fact, talking to him earlier, I was saying um, the Rhodesian War was probably a bit of a dress rehearsal for what was what was to come to come afterwards. But um, Hamish, thanks very much for, for your time. Uh, great, great to have a chance to talk to you. Yeah, thanks, Hannes. Uh, all the guys on my cadet course have been bugging me to to get together with you and uh, have a chat. So <laughs> uh, here we are. You've already um, interviewed a couple of our guys, of course. Yeah, Hamish. Um, what I didn't mention, but I'll mention now, your dad, the late General Derry McIntyre, who was um, a, a huge personality apart from being um, a very serious soldier, um, who played a, a major role in the whole Rhodesian War story. So I wonder if we could kick off with you telling us something about your dad, where he came from, how he ended up in Rhodesia, and a bit about his story. Yeah, sure, Hannes. Um, it, it is quite an interesting story, actually, and I confirmed all these details with my mother this week in Scotland, uh, because I was still a little bit hazy, and she's, and she's 93, and she's as sharp as a pin. So <laughs> um, th thanks, to, thanks to Mary McIntyre for that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, when Dad left grammar school, my grandmother was a headmistress. And she just said, right, you're enrolling at Aberdeen University and you're going to become a doctor. So he off, off he went to varsity and um, he told me many years later that it took him four years to get kicked out of university because he really <laughs> hated medicine. So he then was called up to the army, which I didn't realize they had sort of conscription in those days as well. And he was, uh, he, he joined the Grenadier Guards um, and he was then selected while he was there. Uh, to go on an officer's course, which he did in, he didn't go to Sanders, he did it in some other funny place. Let me check my notes, my mother said, uh, in Chester. So I didn't know that there even was an officer's course in Chester. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant and posted to one parachute battalion. Uh, my folks got married and a week later, dad was posted to Egypt for six months. So he did sort of six months of parachuting and playing the fool in Egypt uh, before coming back uh, to the UK. And then his, his, he was promoted to full lieutenant and his, uh, his conscription ended. He was without a job. So he didn't really know what to do, but he knew he didn't want to live in, in the UK. That he had made his mind up already. He didn't like the weather and want to, wanted to get out. A bit of an adventurer. So he went down to London. Um, he, I think he, my mother and him were staying with my grandparents in Aberdeen at the time. So he went down to London and organized two interviews. One was with, with a company called Frey Bentos, which you might remember. <laughs> and that was <laughs> the ultimate goal there was to become a farmer in Argentina, believe it or not. But his induction meant he would have to work a winter in Bristol in a uh, slaughtering factory uh, over winter for, for six months. He just said, he, well, you know, he didn't really like that. And the second interview was with the Rhodesian army. Um, so he went off to Rhodesia House in, in Trafalgar Square and they said, oh, well, lovely, well, we'll make you a sergeant. So he, he jumped at the chance and said, that's fine. Yeah, as long as there's sort of future promotions, which they said, yes. So him and my mother zooted out to, uh, to, to Rhodesia, ended up in Llewellyn in uh, 1950, I think it was 55, 56. And he was commissioned as a second lieutenant on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, 1957. So, <laughs> And then obviously from there, his, his, uh, his uh, military progression was, was quite good. He, he, I think he got accelerated promotion three or four times. And as you, we all know, he held some really good posts. I mean, one of his favorite was CEO of the RLI. Uh, but he was also, I think he enjoyed his time at School of Infantry. And I think he really enjoyed uh, being Brigade Commander 3 Brigade. I think that was probably his favorite post because he had a lot of Greek friends that he made there who he until he died, we're still in contact with. Yes, so uh, I, I think, you know, that's yeah. where I'm, I'm just going to butt in there, Hamish. That's where yeah, I sure. got to know your dad. Um, was oh, okay. Brigade. Yes, and, and one of his great friends was a chap by the name of Ajax Kirkus. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was a huge uh, personality in, in, in the Manikaland Amtali community. Uh, everybody who lived in Amtali, I think, will remember Ajax. 
And yeah. he, he was also a great friend of Ron Reed Daly's, uh, yeah. old Ajax, and he was the R, he was the RSM at Four Ara at the Territorial Battalion. So there was never right. a dull moment around Ajax. Yeah, and, and Ajax's daughter, Athene, uh, became a very good friend of my sister Susan's. I think okay. they were nursing together. So, you know, I knew Athene as well. Um, so, yeah, I think I may be wrong with this, but I have a feeling that she was killed in a robbery or something one day. Um, I can't remember. But I no, think that, was, that was Johnny, that was Ajax's brother, Johnny, oh, who okay. was the mayor of Amtali. Um, that's right. And I think his daughter was killed, yeah. But they were yeah. they were both uh, big figures yeah. in in that community. Yeah, you know, Dad was a how do I put this politely? He was a serious womanizer, <laughs> as I think most most people know. Um, and he was a bit of a skate, to be honest. You know, he, he he liked a good party, and I'm sure you know he told some some incredibly good jokes. <laughs> he's he's a raconteur of note. He was a you go to a dinner party with dad, you just end up with a sore jaw from laughing. You know, he, <laughs> once you got in the string of it, he just went crazy. Um, yeah, he, look, he was a great guy. He was, he was well admired. Um, he died in 2003. He had a couple of strokes um, and then he had a major stroke and sort of hung around for a couple of months and then died in, in sort of June, I think it was 2003. Hamish, what, uh, um, he, he ended up a general. What was his last yeah. post in the, in the, in, in the Rhodesian army? He was Chief of Staff Administration as a Major General. Uh, there were two Chiefs of Staff. One was Operational, one was, was Admin. Uh, the other one was Sandy McLean. Um, and mm -hmm. when John Hickman uh, retired um, or left the military, uh, it was either my dad or Sandy who were going to become Army Commander. And as it turned out, Sandy was one day senior to my father. So Sandy became Army Commander and Dad stayed on as Chief of Staff Admin. I think Bruce Campling went in um, as Chief of Staff Ops after that. And then, of course, the war finished and Dad left. Um, we okay. moved down to South Africa. Okay, Ange. Um, and now your story. Where were you, where were you born and, and your progression? Yeah, I was, I was born in Bulawayo. Uh, Dad was down there, obviously, at Llewellyn at the time. I was born in 1957. Uh, my sister was born in 1957 as well, so Mom had a hard time of it. Um, Susan was is 18 January 57 and I was 11 December 57. So my poor mother was pregnant for like 20 months in a row. She's a poor woman. But <laughs> anyway, I thought we wouldn't get into that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, dad moved around a lot. Um, obviously, as a, an officer in the army, he, get, he got posted a lot. So I think when I was about nine or 10, he put me into boarding school in Guala um, at Cecil John Rhodes. And from Cecil John Rhodes, I progressed to Chaplin, um, where you, inter you interviewed Ray Hawkinson not long ago. Uh, Ray was there. He was our head boy. I think he was a year or two senior to me. Really good sportsman was Ray. And, you know, I didn't really do very well at school. I wasn't really interested in it. I loved my sport. I loved being out in the bush. Um, so, you know, I got, did my M levels and then I left. I was called up to intake 150 um, and to the RLI. And just to go back slightly on that, uh, my mother had a very good friend who used to work at Weeby College, a lady called Mary Ford. And Mary organized me a bursary to go to Weeby. So my plan was to do my national service and go off and become a farmer. Not unlike my father's ideas, but I didn't know that at the time. I just, I loved, I didn't like being in an office. It didn't work for me. And I didn't want to be a soldier, as it turns out, because, you know, dad was a soldier. And I knew when I went to the RLI, which I was where I was called up to, I was going to take flak. There's no question. You know, with A and O McIntyre, Dad's initials, and mine are A J O. You know, it didn't take the NCOs very long to work out that I was Daddy's Daddy's little boy. You know, so <laughs> I took a bit of flack. <laughs> but then one of the things that I always wanted to do was to parachute. I wanted to skydive, and that came from John Pearson, who was a friend of my dad's. He was a keen skydiver, and I just I wanted to skydive. So I think about two weeks into intake 150 in RLI. Um, some guys came across from SAS and said, look, uh, we're looking for volunteers to come to the squadron. So I put my hand up immediately. So I was bundled off to SAS and I did my recruit course with SAS with some really incredible instructors. Guys like Paul French and those sort of guys who were amazing. Uh, sadly, I got glandular fever about 10 days before uh, selection went on. I booked myself out of hospital, did the pre-rev did the first couple of days in selection, but then I, I just, I was Kazavak actually off the, uh, 
of the selection. I, I just couldn't do it anymore. So I got back to squadron and uh, Rob Johnson was the training officer and he said, listen, you know, you were, we want you to stay on in, in SAS, so just wait for the next selection, which I think was about eight weeks away. But after about three weeks of being an absolute gummer pile, doing nothing, you know, fetch me this bottle of water from there and do this and do that, uh, that didn't work for me. So I asked for an RTU back to RLI, it was granted. I went across to RLI and was, I was uh, posted to 14 Troop 3 Commander under Jug Thornton with uh, guys like Charlie Warren and those sort of guys in, in 14 Troop. And I need to, sorry, I need to go back. I forgot about this. Uh, I went on the officer selection for Inf 2519, um, which is the, the year before I, was, I went on the course. And I got what's called a fail watch. They said to me, you think you've got potential, but uh, you know, you're not mature enough. Go away, and, go away for a year and come back. So I left. And then obviously now, the, in the meantime, I went, I joined 3 Commander. And, and I discovered that I really loved being a soldier. Um, it, it suited me. Um, so during that year, I actually spoke to Jack Thornton and said, look, I want to go and go to the next officer selection because I really fancy making a career out of the army. To his credit, and he helped me with this. He said, okay, Hamish, let's have a look at how, this is how we do the map reading, this is how we do orders groups. So he helped me a lot. And dad was brigade commander, three brigade at the time. So we were based at Grand Reef and because I was under 21, I had to get his permission to go on the course. So I got permission to go into town. I got a lift into town in one of the uni mobs, I think it was. Went to his office and said, this is, this is what I want to do. Will you sign this form? So in his, his normal fashion, he gave me a lecture. He called me James. It's the only time he said, when my dad's in a bad mood or wants to punish me, he calls me James. <laughs> because Hamish is actually Scottish for James. I'm christened James. So it was like, James, this is actually what he said to me. The only thing I can ever give you is the fucking name McIntyre. You know my dad spoke. But don't fuck it up. I said, okay, now I'll try not to. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Salute. And leave. So I got to the, the selection for M2520, and guess who's the, uh, I don't know what you would call him, the senior officer in charge of the selection? It's my father. So <laughs> now I arrive there, and my dad is, is, is running the selection course. Um, to, to his credit, he never, um, he never <coughs> once listened to a lecture of mine, or he never attended any of the things that I did. And the only thing that he did do was at the end of the selection was to tell me that I passed, um, and that I could you know, come back on the course, on the regular officers course. And if, you know, if we can talk about cadet courses for a little while, um, Anas, it's a, uh, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, 450 odd people applied uh, to, to go on the, on the selection. 44 of us passed the selection and attended the actual course. And at the end of the 18 months or 13 months, bang taking off. Um, the end of the 13 months, 18 of us were commissioned. So we were the biggest cadet course at Intac. And we were the biggest cadet course to finish the course. So it, we were really lucky. We had some incredible instructors. We had uh, guys like George Lambert Porter was, was a sort of part-time instructor. Uh, Captain Mike Wilson from the RAR was our course officer and he's he was brilliant on the course. And then we had the, uh, Charlie Davies Hotfoot as our drill instructor. And so the first phase, we had two drill instructors. We had Cocky Binks and uh, Charlie Davies, but Charlie stayed on the rest of the course. Uh, so we, we had incredible instruction, absolutely phenomenal instruction. But you know, to, to fill the guys in, um, if you think of a recruit course in any, I don't care where it is, Llewellyn Barracks, SAS, RLI, it doesn't matter. The whole course is 17 weeks. As a cadet, first phase is 17 weeks. So you have 17 weeks of just <laughs> being run ragged. I mean, the whole idea about, about first phase, and it doesn't matter whether you're an officer cadet or you're a recruit, is the military wants to break you down. So that's why you have all the late nights and all the punishments and all the extra, all the extra duties you do is to break you down. And then at the end of first phase, they then start building you into what they want. So as a normal soldier, you could do six weeks of first phase, you learn how to drill and everything, and then you move on to becoming a soldier because there's not that much you need to learn. As an officer cadet, 17 weeks of it, really takes it out of you. It's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. It's probably 18 to 20 hour days, every single day. There's no days off. Um, there are constant lectures and, and lessons, constant drill, constant PT, constant, constant messing you around, you know, doing change parades at night and all those sort of things. So for 17 weeks, they really break you. And we ended up uh, after 17 weeks, we had 22 people left on the course only. 
So half the course quit uh, during the first phase. And it really is that tough. And it, there's nothing that you do. You learn basic weaponry and you, you, know, you learn the basics about soldiering. But you only get into it when you get into second and third phases, actually becoming an officer and learning how to become an officer. Um, so, you know, after 17 weeks, you, you then go into second phase and second phase is classical warfare. And to be honest with you, when we started the classical warfare phase, I just thought it was a complete waste of time. Why would I want to know about classical warfare? We're fighting a coin war, not a classical war. But it's about 15 weeks of, of classical war. Um, so you're digging trenches, you're doing all the phases of classical war. And in, in essence, it actually ends up teaching you a hell of a lot. You know, each cadet has to present a, a presentation. I did the, um, this, what did I do? The Siegfried line, I think, in Italy. I did a presentation on that. You do it in, in front of, you know, majors and colonels and everybody who are asking you questions. So you get weeks to prepare that. And you have to, you have to present like a three-hour lecture on a particular subject. And mine was the Siegfried line, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think it was the Siegfried line of that one. And you, you also, you start learning how to, um, how to command soldiers because you get attached to like a company of uh, RER would come along and you'd go and do a, a classical exercise and you're, you're then doing things called tutes, which is or tactical exercises without troops. So you'll be standing on the rugby field, but you've got to imagine that you're attacking a base and you've got to give your orders and how you move your guys around and you know where you, where you bring your supporting weapons in and that sort of thing. So you learn all that in, in classical war, which actually gives you the grounding for coin war. So it, although at the beginning of the classical war phase, I thought this is just a complete waste of time, it ended up being really interesting and gives you the grounding that you require, that you need to move on to, onto the coin phase. You also do a, an escape and evasion um, exercise as a cadet, which is very similar to an essay selection, as it turns out. Um, having done them both, I can say that they're both equally as hard. And I think we did, I may be wrong, something in excess of 300 kilometers in, in eight days um, of walking without rations. You know, they arrive and give you a live chicken. You must catch it. You know, <laughs> so you don't catch it, you don't eat. Um, and then you get captured, uh, or obviously arranged. And we were in Saluki in the middle of winter. And we were captured. So now you're stripped down to your underwear and you're standing in a river and you get waterboarded and tortured by one POU, one psychological operations unit. Um, and you, you, you've you been taught that you can give your number, rank, and name, and that's it. Um, so I think I lasted about four hours of interrogation until I said, okay, what do you want? Because I want a cup of coffee. So <laughs> I don't think I did particularly well on that. We had a guy on our course called Rene Rechtin, who's a, a black belt karate dude. He never even gave him his name. He went the whole night. And actually at the debrief, they said, who's the cadet that we don't know? And we all said, well, you need to find out, don't you? But it was Rene. Um, so that was an interesting exercise. And obviously at the end of that, you walk around a corner and there's, you know, you walk into the farmhouse and there's just steaks and everything laid out. Laid out. But you can't eat them because you, your stomach has shrunk and all you're worried about the blisters on your feet. So, yeah, we did that in second phase. And the end of second phase, they cut the numbers on the course again. And four guys, including Buri Hume, uh, was sent home. So Buri was on our course, and then he was sent home at the end of second phase. Um, and we were cut down to 18 people. And as it turns out, all 18 of us were then commissioned. Um, and we had some guys on our course who you know, we had uh, Andre Skippers, um, who we, I know you've interviewed many times and written a book with. Um, we had uh, guys like Davy Greenalge, who's now dead. Um, Davy was the Rhodesian under 20 rugby captain. And I think the youngest guy ever commissioned is a regular cadet was a regular officer. Yeah, I think he was still 17 when he came in, uh, when he joined the course uh, at the beginning of the course. Mm -hmm. Then we have we had some other really incredible guys. We had uh, Fabio Falzoy, who unfortunately was killed a couple of months after he was commissioned. Hell of a nice guy. We had guys like Andre Stocker, who's also dead now. He died of uh, cancer. Andre was just an incredible guy. Uh, Ray Stocker, sorry, not Andre. Um, so we had, some, we had some really good guys. Uh, great RER guys. You, you interviewed Graham Trass. Yes. I don't know if you're aware that right? I don't know if you're aware how it works. And the, the third phase is coin warfare, which we all know. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. It's like 15 or 16 weeks of working with troops again and learning how our war, our Rhodesian war, went. But uh, at the end of the third phase, you are given a piece of paper and you have to select which units you would like to go to. So I put down one RLI, two RLI, three RLI. You know, I didn't want to go anywhere else. Mike Wilson, my course officer, was an RAR officer, so he called me back in and said, you can't do this. So I said, then maybe we should put uh, pay corps and corps of chaplains or something, which he didn't see as a joke. 
And then they end up with one RLI, one RER, two RER, uh, like you're supposed to. Graham Tras put that down as well. When we were given our assignments, which is late in fourth phase, um, probably six weeks before the end of the course, so maybe after the Christmas break, Graham Tras was told he was going to services. So he said, I refuse my commission then. I didn't come here to become a services guy. I came here to fight terrorists, communism. So Bruce, it was a bit of a political thing because, you know, Kiwi had come across from New Zealand specifically to do that. Um, so I think the late Bruce Nelgar got involved, um, spoke to Omni HQ, and they found a position for Graham at 2RAR. And, of course, the rest is history. He got a silver cross, incredibly brave guy. Um, now lives in, in uh, New Zealand, back in New Zealand with his wife, mm -hmm. uh, Sharon, and I think they had ended up having six boys. So big family. <laughs> But yeah, we had we had some really good guys. I mean, we had guys like Vince McCabe who had failed twenty five nineteen, came back into twenty five twenty. So he was like a source of information for us because uh, he, I think, he'd gone all the way through the second phase. But yeah, eighteen of us were commissioned, and it was a very interesting uh, course. So, cadet course, regular army officer cadet course. Well, we could speak about speak about it for hours, but let's not do that. <laughs> So yeah, it's a Amish, who was who was at your passing out parade? Who who was the uh, who's officiating? The reviewing officer. Yeah, the reviewing officer was was Ian Smith. Funny enough, we were okay. very lucky. So he came along, and, and uh, I knew Ian Smith um, firstly through my dad, but secondly, uh, he was a chaplain boy, and so was I. And uh, I occasionally used to get invited out to his farm, um, Gwenora just for a weekend. So, you know, it was, I don't know how, how my dad organized that or how Ian Smith organized it, but I really liked Ian Smith's wife, Janet. She was a wonderful lady. Um, but yeah, I went to his farm a couple of times, so I knew him and he didn't say a word to me on prayer. I was quite upset when he walked past me. I thought he was gonna say, hey, how are you doing Hamish? But he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if he recognized me. <laughs> but yeah, we were very lucky. We had Ian Smith. Um, and of course we did the traditional thing in the nest after the parade. It's tradition that as regular cadets, the senior army officer on, on there, and I think it was Hickman at the time, um, gets woken up at sort of six o'clock in the morning because we haven't gone to bed yet. And we all troop into town and then the meek, they stay in the meek and we get up and they have to come and inspect us at sort of six in the morning, um, which which took place. And then you go back to the mess and carry on drinking a bit more and then, then you just pass out. So it's, I, don't, I, wrote, I don't remember a hell of a lot about my, <laughs> my commissioning parade. I do remember that Peter Rich was the CEO of RLI. Now, I knew Peter well, obviously. Um, I called him Uncle Peter. And my dad and him were, were big mates. So at my commissioning parade, or, uh, I think at the afternoon tea before the ball, I saw him and I saluted him and said, good afternoon, sir, how are you doing? And he said, so you're coming to RLI? I said, yes, I was wearing my RLI collar dogs, obviously, because you after the, after the end of the march off the square, you go and put your, RLI, your battalion uh, greens on, which are made for you. So I was wearing my RLI greens. And he said, so which commander do you want to go to? Now, having been in three commander, I said, uh, anything except two. So he said, why? I said, because it's a shit commander, <laughs> which is what we believed in three commander at the time. Uh, to which he said, well, that's really bad luck for you because uh, your dad was OC two commander. I was OC two commander. So you're going to two commander. <laughs> so a couple of days later, I, I uh, reported to two commander. And the, the, the commander was actually out on parade. And I have a nice story about this, and you'll recognize the names. So I was told, listen, there's about four or five days, just hang around the mess, and uh, the commander would back in. There's no use sending you out to the bush to bring you back three or four days later. So I got a couple of days extra r, &R. I was as happy as Larry. Settled into my room at uh, Skid Row, the, the uh, officer's quarters. And I was actually at the two commander lines, and I wasn't in uniform, because um, I was expecting them to come on like a Thursday, and it was a Wednesday. And... Uh, I've just been in my troop store because I took over from Vernon Prinsloo, who recently died. So Vernon was in charge of six troop. He was posted to support commander. So Vernon and I were doing actually the final thing. He said, I just want to show you something at the uh, in the troop store. So he opened up, gave me the keys, and he disappeared. And I was literally hanging around the commander, and here comes two commander arrives. And this guy with moustache and beard, this thick gets off. And I'm like, who the hell is that? And that ends up being Simon Horoff, who was the major in charge. He was our OC at the time. Some could grow a beard in about a day. I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> anyway, so I'm hanging around. I've introduced myself to him, but I, have, I don't know who, who's in six troop. I have no idea who the guys are. They just 
guys on the distance says six troop on your on your sleeve, you know. So I'm standing around there in the series and the late Pete Opperman, who I'm sure you know, mm-hmm. walked up to me on the trip and he said, uh, are you new here? In his lovely Afrikaans accent. And I said, yes, I am. He said, and, and uh, what what troop are you? And I, I won't use his language. So I said, I'm six troop. He said, well, don't flipping stand there. Go and unload that fucking trunk, that truck there. <laughs> Take the stuff to the truck store. So I did that for about 20 minutes of lugging tents around and all sorts of shit. I said, this is enough of this crap. So I sat down on my desk. Oppenman walked in and tore a strip off me. Yes. He gave me a bollocking like only an ROI NCO can do. And when he finished, I said, just so you know, my name is Lieutenant McIntyre. And he looked at me and I promise you he didn't, didn't flinch. He said, well, you're still a puss. <laughs> Sorry. So we got on very well. I, uh, Pete was an unbelievable soldier. Uh, you know, he finished his RSM in one of the Reiki battalions in South Africa. He, you could put Pete on the ground and he would find the enemy. He just, he was a brilliant soldier. I mm. learned a hell of a lot from him. So so now, if I carry on. Really, um, we're a major part of the success of that, of that battalion. Oh, there's no question. You know, you do 13 months to learn how to become an officer and then you get stuck with an NCO and RLI and he teaches you properly. There's no question about that. Mm-hmm. And when I joined uh, Six Troop, I had an incredible troop. I must tell you, I had some unbelievable soldiers. I was fortunate to have a stick that was made up of Mike Dodd, Steve Bacon, and Ivan Hudson. Ivan was my machine gunner. I still think the best gun I've ever worked with. He just, and the guys had eyes and they had attitude. We were pinned down one day, they were singing to the gooks, you know, by the rivers of Babylon. I think the gooks must have thought we were on drugs or something. But they were, they were incredible soldiers. So I, we got the next bush trip. And I think my first two contacts, I screwed up completely. I was still thinking left flanking, looking for you know, high ground and all sorts of cuck, and my troops are running at the goods. So we got back, we were at Grand Reef, and uh, Peter Oppenman actually came to me and said, we don't think you can be our troop officer. <laughs> Whoops. So I went off to go and see Horoff, and I said, look, I'm struggling. And I was. I mean, I, the guys were so much more experienced than me, and I, I had to get this school of infantry thing out of my brain. It, it doesn't, doesn't work in the RLI, as you know. It's uh, So what Harov did is good was he said, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you to eight troop, not six troop, and I'm going to give you Trevor Hodson to become your, your mentor. So I spent uh, about four weeks working as a troopie in Trevor Hodson's stick, learning how to be an officer. Um, best thing that, that, that ever happened to me, uh, without any doubt. And, and you then learn what uh, commanding men is about, not what you've been taught at School of Infantry. School of Infantry gives you, the, gives you the grounding. And I'm sure it's different in other units, but in the RLI, NCOs rule the RLI. Make no mistake about that. You're giving the orders, but the NCOs are the guys who run, the, who run everything. So I was very fortunate. I ended up with some really, really good top-class NCOs and some incredibly aggressive soldiers. And in, in all the punch-ups I had, I never lost a troopie, not one, in all my contacts, which was amazing. And, you know, we had... We had weeks we, or um, tours where we went out for six weeks and killed 140 people, you know, and we, we lost very few people. We quite a few guys wounded, but uh, two commander itself lost very few guys. And I don't know whether we were lucky or whether we just did our job correctly, but, uh, you know, I can't see other RLI sticks doing anything differently. You know, we, as you know, we just walked until we got shot at and then returned fire. So it sounds stupid, but it worked for us, as you know. So, yeah, I spent all my time with two commander, um, I was in six troop. I, I broke my back on an operational jump. So I spent uh, six weeks and eight weeks in hospital. And then I was attached to training troop for sort of two months while I recuperated. And then back to back to Tupamano. Um, I was pr- promoted up to full lieutenant and then to captain. I was 2IC Tupamano. Um, Alan Shaw was actually the OC at that stage. I'm not sure where Alan was, but the closing down of the battalion, um, I had the privilege of marching Tupamano off the square when we laid up the colours. So, yeah, that was a... Tell us, um, tell us about Op Snoopy. Um, I know you were in the thick of it there. Um, yeah. I think, did the tanks come? or they, they, I know Armour Arma got involved and um, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, if I remember correctly. No, you're, you're 100% right. Um, I think it was September 78. Um, and Op Snoopy, if you remember, was the, when the int that we had on Op Snoopy turned out not to be very accurate because when we landed on the ground, it was just spread out. It was just, 
you know, we walked and walked and walked and walked. We had to keep showing Daglo panels because nobody knew where we were. And I think during the day, we probably had four or five small skirmishes where we may have killed four, five, six people. Uh, we really didn't see a lot of the action. Anyway, that night, uh, we decided to obviously bed down and ambush. And we had a, we had a big call sign we were there. So we had my, Major Horoff was with us. So he withdrew about 80 meters. And I had the right-hand stock group. And Trevor Hodson had the left-hand stock group. And we had some of the 10 troop guys, including... Um, what's his name? I'm blank for a second. Yeah, and he actually started a security company called Irinus. British guy, Fraser Brown. Uh, he was with me in the stock group. And Fraser had put up a uh, Claymore mine because we didn't know what was happening. I mean, now we heard a vehicle coming. We saw headlights. But we, I honestly thought it was just a like a Land Rover or something. So when it got in range, Fraser popped it. And if you ever see the pictures of that, um, you'll see that the driver's hatch is open. So we believe that obviously some shrapnel from the Claymore went in there and took the driver out straight away. And what was it? A, and then what, it was another personnel carrier, the, the BTR. Yeah, it was a BTR 152. Mm -hmm. BTR 152. Right. Now, this thing rolled to a stop eight meters in front of us. My stop group was literally like, we had no cover. We were lying behind our backpacks. We weren't expecting anything. We, we'd had a day where we'd seen hardly anybody, as I said. So we thought we were just going to have a nice lion and get picked up tomorrow morning. Well, it didn't work out that well. So now this thing rolls to a stop and the guys have got a PKM mounted and they're firing through the firing slots. And we're literally, and I think eight meters is probably quite accurate, maybe between six and eight meters away from, and from the guys. So we're lying behind our backpacks. That's all we've got is cover. And we've got a troopie next to me called Ian Otten. Uh, he got shot through the foot, and but through the heel. So you can imagine it went in by his ankle bone and down up at the bottom of his heel. So that was the angle of the attack from these guys in the BTR 152. Some of them bailed out the back. We dispatched them quite quickly. Uh, one or two of them decided to try and lie underneath the vehicle and use that for cover. We took them out. Trevor Hodson put a, an RPG-7 through the front of it uh, from the other stock group position. And if you look at the picture, you'll actually see where the, the RPG-7 went in as well. And then Fraser Brown um, snuck up on it and lobbed a bunker bomb into the vehicle, which took care of all those guys. So the, the fighting was over. I think there were 12 or 14 guys in there. We killed them all. Um, and then we withdrew back to the commando position. But we were, by now, this thing is burning. So we were a little bit worried that we were a target now. And we, you know, we thought maybe we were going to get mortared or something like that. So we said, okay, look, we, we need to move out a little bit. And literally, as we said that, we heard this clank, 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 clank. <laughs> and uh, three uh, T-72s, I think they were. We, I don't know which, what tank they were, but certainly three tanks and a, at least a platoon of Frelimo. Yeah, they come down the road towards the towards the burning BTR 152. So we contemplated taking one out. Trevor Hudson and I were sort of take, he still had one rocket left in his RPG. Like, maybe we should take one out. Luckily, I became a coward then and said, no, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> I didn't think we'd do, do too well with one RPG-7 against three tanks. Um, anyway, we, so we started running. And Ian Norton, the guy who was shot, started off hobbling. He ended up moving very quickly. And what they did was they came, one of these tanks had a searchlight on it, a big searchlight. And he was, they were literally, now you can imagine there's 40 of us running. So we're leaving a really wide path. It's like a game trail. So they're firing their 84 mil gun down the, our line of flight. So we were zigzagging the whole night and we ran the whole night. They chased us for seven hours, probably fired 15 rounds out of that, uh, out of those, uh, out of the 84 mil guns. And a lot of 12.7 fire down the line. Um, but because we were zigzagging, we, we, re we really were motoring. Um, we, they never caught up with us. They got to within about 150 meters of us at one stage. We could hear them talking. So we were quite concerned. And then at first light, uh, two hunters came overhead and buzzed them. They were told they couldn't take them out. And so they didn't take them out and they turned around and went back to Chimoyo. But yeah, that was a, it was a really interesting night. Um, but, um, so it's what, really what, quite what, You didn't call in artillery? No, nope. yeah. we were running. We would literally, we were running. It was a, uh, it was very obvious what they were trying to do. Um, they were, we don't, it's difficult to estimate how many Frelimo troops were there because there was a lot of them. Um, and I, I keep saying maybe a platoon, it might've been two platoons, I don't know, but there was a lot of noise going on. And we, we weren't in a position 
um, ammo-wise or strength-wise to, to lay an ambush against three tanks. If it had been just for Lima alone, of course we would have ambushed them. But you know, to take on three tanks uh, supported by infantry, when you've got no support weapons yourself, except for one RPG-7 rocket, a uh, better part of valor is to leave that alone and get out of the way. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was not different. Much. But, yeah. not, not, much, <laughs> not much chance there. Um, no. Hamish, the, the last year of the war, uh, what what we what were you busy on in the main? Sorry, say again. The last year of the war. Yeah, this is the war we're in. We're this this is seventy eight. Um, yeah. Let's talk about after that and going into into seventy nine. Yeah. Look, the RLI was never very good at, at being in town. Um, you know, we obviously we were there for the elections and we had orders, as everybody knew. Um, to, we, we, we actually were going to take out um, the Zonu PF headquarters, uh, was what we were tasked with. But I think they were staying at the Seven Arts or some, some building along the Enterprise Road. I can't remember what it was, but we were, that was going to be our target if it went. So we were sort of based on the corners there, hanging around, waiting for things to happen. Of course, it never happened. Um, so we, that was a bit disappointing for us, as, as I'm sure for every... RLI soldier and every, in fact, every soldier, you know, we expected to be able to go and take them out. Um, and it, it never came to fruition. I, I still don't know why. Um, the, the, the reason is lots of reasons, as you know, have been sort of pointed out to everybody about we did this and we're going to do that and whatnot. But uh, I don't know why the orders never came through. Maybe it was just too much for us to do. I don't know. So we did a lot of drinking, a lot of partying. We had, uh, a lot of company funds, which we weren't going to hand over to one Zimbabwe commando battalion. So we had uh, commando parties and we literally would say, okay, well, we're going to club tomorrow tonight. And the whole commando would go to club tomorrow and we'd pay the bill. So we did a lot of that. Um, I was fortunate that I was quite good friends with a, an NCO called Pete Ace. And Pete was a big fisherman. Um, so he suggested that we go and see Charlie Orst, who was the CEO. And... Uh, see if we could organize a tracking course up in <laughs> your Mumba farm in, in, on the Zambezi River. Of course, there was no tracking course. And Charlie knew that when I went in to go and see him. He said, so how many people are going? So I said, well, it's me and Pete Ace and I think probably one or two other NCOs. And who's going to teach the tracking? I said, I am. He said, listen, enjoy the fishing. So <laughs> 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 we, took, we got into a uni uh, took Lovemore, our Batman, with us. Yes, I remember Lovemore. Yeah, you know, I love us. An interesting story about Lovers as well, if I digress slightly. He was my dad's Batman. And I think he was Batman for 10 Troop. Mm. So when I arrived, uh, the Batman was a guy called Jock McKenzie for 6 Troop. Lovemore just said, no, 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 no. Yeah, you are Mr. McIntyre's son. I'm taking over your 6 Troop. So they swapped and he came across to, to, to 6 Troop to be my Batman. Oh, really? So... Lovemore Masana, what a character. Um, I think I think Lovemore was actually deployed a couple of times, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. And he did guard <laughs> duty. Um, he caught two terrorists at the at the top of uh, the pass um, in Makuti. He literally went in for a drink there one night, um, and there were two goots in there. He's like, oh, I'd love to join you. Let me see your weapon. And he <laughs> turned the weapon and then said, come with me. Took him to the police station. <laughs> so Lovers was an incredible guy. We got him... When one Zimbabwe commando battalion was formed, he became the RSM of the MT yard. So I have absolutely no doubt that Lovemore worked a scam with all the fuel because he was a sharp cookie. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you speak to the, to, the, to the two commando troopies, you'll like this story, Alice. Whenever a new batch arrives, so you say, you say 156 passes out and you're getting 15 recruits from 156. Lovemore would put on a CSM's armband <laughs> and he'd shout, fall out the commando! <laughs> Everybody falls in. <laughs> no, old guys know what's going on. And now you look at these, these new guys from 156 or whatever you, you intake it was, looking at a black sergeant major in the RLI. It's like, what the flipping hell's going on here? <laughs> would just, all your old guys piss off. All your fresh foot stay here. And then Lovemore would lead them the right act. You guys are, you are obligated to buy me three beers. Each one of you must buy me three three beers on this bush trip. And this is how you will treat your Batman. He was a serious character. I loved him to bits. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So Hamish, um, after the fishing trip with Pete Ace, Pete was actually from Zambia originally, wasn't he? He was, a, he was from yeah. 
Yeah, I remember Pete. He went back to Zambia. I mean, okay. you know, we caught we we caught two deep freeze full of tiger on the, on in a week. It was just it was crazy. Nobody had fished there for I don't know how many years. So, you know, I think we caught one in Kupi to start with. Uh, filtered it through the rods in, and then it just it just went crazy. In the end, we weren't even keeping you know, anything less than about three or four pounds. We just throw it back in. It wasn't big enough to keep. And Pete went back to to Salisbury, had them all filleted, made pickled fish out of them. I'm sure he made a small fortune out of it. I'm sure that's why he wanted to go and do it <laughs> in typical ROI fashion. But yeah, he was a good guy. And yeah, you're right. He went back to Zambia and got a farm, I think, in Zambia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah incredible guys. So where did where where did it all end for you, Hamish? The military. I, yeah, you know, I had a, a girlfriend who I was I was crazy about, um, and she had gone overseas on a, like a world tour. She wanted to tour the world with a friend of hers, and they got to London, and her friend said, well, "I'm not going to do this anymore. I want to go home." So she was stuck in London with a ticket to go around the rest of the world. So I resigned from the army, bought a ticket, and went to go and join her. So instead of taking up the offices or the offers that RLI officers were getting from, you know, from South Africa and from Oman and places like that, I went around the world for 11 months. Um, well, actually, it was about nine months. Um, we ended up breaking up, you know, a year later anyway. So it was just, it was, it was a really stupid thing to do. But I was young, impetuous, and, uh, you know, I got, I got to see the world, to be fair. But uh, it was, <laughs> it, it ended for me there. And then when I came down here, I should actually have joined the South African Defence Force. But when I went to the recruiting office, as I said, they offered me sergeant and the Randburg commander or something. I said, I'm a battle-hardened veteran, you know, of the RLI as a captain. You, you can't do that to me. And they wouldn't offer me anymore. Um, so I never joined the SADF. I, I think it's because I'd been out for a year when I did this tour. Um, had I come down, obviously, I would have probably joined 3-2 or, you know, 44 Paris or something like that. But, uh, you yeah, I didn't in the end. Sadly, I should have. What do you think we might have done better or differently? Have anything spring to mind? Honest, no, not really. You know, it's a, I don't know that there's much we could have done to change the final outcome because the rest of the world was against us. Mm -hmm. You know, we could have hung on, militarily, we could have hung on for much longer. And when we had them in the keeps, we could have taken them out, you know, so we could have struck a big blow, um, which we didn't do, obviously. But I don't think in the in the long run that we could have we could have had a, had a different outcome. Um, yeah, I think no matter what happened, we would have had it. Mm. I think the country was done. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm inclined. Then, I'm inclined to agree with you. You know, um, there's an ongoing debate about whether UDI should have been declared or not, and that Smith made a mistake by doing it. And um, you know, I hear this. But I really, I agree with you. I think the world was going to have its way with us, one way or the other. Um, we did our best, but the odds against us were just so overwhelming. Um, yeah. it, was just a, it was just a matter of time. No, no know, matter what we, we did. Yeah, look, I think that we, we proved to the world that we could innovate, that we could do anything we wanted mm -hmm. to, that militarily we were um, I think that we were probably the best fighting units in the world uh, at that stage. I have a, I see a lot of what goes on here. And I think that one of the things that happens in, in current warfare um, is that the average soldier doesn't want to close with and kill the enemy. He doesn't want to close with them at all. He wants to use technology. So he'd rather sit in a in an MRAP, which has got a you know a system that fires back if somebody shoots at you. You don't even have to put your head over the, over the parapet. Um, I think they've lost... With the exception of the, the special forces guys who are, are still exceptional, I must tell you. In general, soldiering has become a, a technological war, um, and you use technology to do all, all your killing for you. So I don't think that the, the actual fighting is good anymore, quite honestly. Um, I don't think the guys have the ability that we used to have. Mm. So that I find interesting. There's, you know, there's, there's some serious technology is all, is all I'm, I can say right now, but it's, yes. there's some really serious technology. You and I can mm. find some time, but it's an incredible technology. Yeah. Um, Hamish, it's just interesting the feedback I get. What does get the attention of modern day soldiers is how little we actually had to work with compared to what they take for granted today. 
it's, it, yeah. times certainly have changed. You know, when I was in Baghdad, and, and I was in Baghdad from 2003 through to about 2010, um, one of the first times I went into an American dining facility was in a place called Camp Victory. And I think it was a Wednesday, and it was a lobster and crab night. So there's 6,000 people eating meals in there, and they're serving lobster and crab, and there's an ice cream bar and a taco bar, and what cool drinks would you like because you just help yourself. I mean, it's just unbelievable. The American Army knows how to go to war, I can tell you. And, and you know, 6,000 people in that camp, they didn't go out the, out the camp. You know, they're just there. You know, it's, it, it, was, it was a huge eye-opener for me as, a, as, a, as an African. We just didn't do that. You know, it was a, if we got a steak every so often, we were happy as hell. These guys... They, there's nothing spared with them. I promise you. It's a, they have incredible machinery, incredible stuff, and, and they, they make use of it. But they don't hold the ground. You know, one of the principles of war is to hold the ground. They don't hold the ground. They go out, smack some people, come back. They don't hold the ground at all. So it, you can never win a war like that. As far as I'm concerned, you can't win a war like that. It's a, and I mean, I, we had the company I worked for had the contracted background for security. So we had, uh, Quite a, we had, well, we had almost a thousand people on that base at one stage. So it was a big base, so you know we we saw a lot of what was going on. We know what's going on, um, and to be honest, it, it, I think that the senior guys, the senior generals in the coalition forces, were really handed a hard number because you know you you, you get up there and you've got to go and kill the enemy, but you can't stay out there because you, it's not your country. You don't know the next guy walking in a, in a looks like a civilian could could be wearing a vest. You know, so it's very difficult to fight against an enemy that you can't identify. They're not, they, in, in 2004, 2005, uh, two, up to 2006, we used to get like 250 incidents a day in, Bag in uh, Baghdad. And that would be simple things. Like you're driving down the road and a guy would just whip out a grenade and throw it at you. You know, and so, okay, well, that's nice, but you can't shoot him because you don't know who it was. Just a grenade blew up on the, on the road next to you. And they would do, they would do things like that, you know, so... They would put uh, IEDs into dead dogs' bodies and things like that. So if something came to move the, the dog, yeah, you'd, they'd blow you up. There were a lot of car bombs. I remember Route Irish, which was the route from uh, the Green Zone through to Baghdad Airport to Camp Victory. Uh, I think our, the record, the, not a record you're proud of, but I think the one day we had three car bombs on the road, um, big car bombs. You know, there's times times were tough then, really tough. Um, and the insurgency was. How were you actually wounded? What what actually happened when you got hurt? Uh, we were um, taking some clients uh, north of Baghdad uh, to a power station, and uh, I got we, we got hit by a thing called an EFP. An EFP is an explosively formed projectile. So, if you know how an RPG seven works, it hits the thing and the, everything inverts, and you get the copper core that goes through. Well, they make roadside bombs like that now, so that it goes through tanks, goes through armor. And we got hit by one of those. Um, luckily, it wasn't very well aimed, so it sort of went up above me, um, and obviously, it, it, it killed my friend next to me. Um, but for me, what happened was it actually came through the armor. We had armor plate on the on the door. Uh, some of it went straight through an armored windscreen and a really thick armored windscreen. But a piece of it bounced back and then hit my slide cover on my AK, and then bounced back into my neck and cut my jugular in half. So I was lucky it wasn't my carotid, because if it's your carotid, you die. Um, and I think it was 17 minutes after the incident, I was in Bencina Hospital in Baghdad being looked at by surgeons. So we had top cover, we had everything. So it was, it was really, I was very lucky that day, make no mistake. Um, it was, uh, if, the, if, the, if the EFP had been, had been aimed slightly lower, it would have gone right through us, because uh, it doesn't slow down. It just goes through. So it's a frightening thing. It goes through tanks. You know, it'll go through a Bradley. So they're, they're serious weapons, and they were common in those days. Well, Hamish, it's been very, very interesting indeed, and uh, really pleased we had this opportunity. And I'm, I'm pleased we had you to talk a bit about your father, because yeah. uh, he certainly deserves to be remembered and remembered very fondly. I don't think um, he made he made too many enemies, your dad. No, I don't think so. Look, he was a, he was a good guy. Um, it, it, from, from me as, a, as, a, as being his son, um, you know, he was a bit of an absentee father, but I understand that he was a soldier. You know, you, 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 it's one of those things, you, you, you can't do that. 
but he was a great guy. Um, I had a lot of time for him, loved him to bits. Um, yeah, still miss him. Still miss him. Anyway. Thank you, Ernest. All right, I saw you. Both of you.